Mention stone circles to many people, and they'll think of people gathering at Stonehenge to watch the sunrise, or hulking megaliths looming out of the mist on a lonely moor, the sheep being careful to only graze outside the circle. They're certainly evocative, if nothing else, and as with the standing stones that we covered last week, we also know very little about them. We don't know why our ancestors built them, or how they used them. So naturally, legend rushes in to fill that vacuum. Or does it? Let's see what folklore we can find about these mysterious stone circles in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well. Obviously, I think I mentioned last week that this week was basically my birthday week, and that was on Thursday. So thank you very much for all the people who wish me a happy birthday. It was much appreciated. And we're going to jump straight into this episode because the fact there's quite a lot to cover. And I should start by saying that it's actually been quite a hard one to write and most of the folklore of these stone circles falls into one of two story types and that's if the circles actually have any legends at all. So as an example I really wanted to include Castle Rig in Cumbria as it's the only one I've actually visited which is really weird. You'd think I would have been in loads of stone circles but apparently not. But there's also very little folklore associated with Castle Rig. So this particular episode is going to look at a handful of circles with folklore attached to them before exploring those two story types in a little bit more detail. As I said last week, I'm going to be avoiding Stonehenge because in many ways it's just too obvious, although one of the legends about it does appear here, and I'm also not covering the Rollright Stones because I have covered them before in the episode about Elder Folklore. So we're going to start off with the Hurlers, which are three circles on Craddock Moor near Lincoln Horn in Cornwall. They're usually dated to the Bronze Age to around about 1500 BC, and two standing stones lie west-southwest of the middle circle, known as the Pipers. Now, according to William Camden in his Britannia of 1586, the circles were originally all human men. They became stones after hurling, which is a ball-based sport, on a Sunday. I did try to work out how it actually worked, but I kind of got a bit confused. So basically, they're just essentially doing sport on a Sunday. Now Jennifer Westwood notes that this origin story is actually a little bit unusual because, as we shall see, most of the stories involving petrified people are a punishment for dancing, not playing sport. That said, the number of players actually required for hurling would explain the sheer number of stones across these three circles. The Pipers, on the other hand, may be a throwback to the dancing-based petrification since they bear little relation to hurling, and we will come back to that later on in the episode. But in 1675, David James Young actually recorded a new tradition, and in this story people could never count the number of stones. So eventually a man put a loaf of bread on each stone and could then count their number. But this idea of uncountable stones is also common to stone circles, as we shall see. And that, in terms of the folklore, is pretty much it. So it basically comes down to, oh, these were people turned into stone, and then you can't count the stones. So that's sort of where we're coming from with this episode. So we're going to move off to Long Meg, which is a large circle in Cumbria, often known as Long Meg and her daughters. And Long Meg is actually the 12 foot stone that stands to one side of the main circle. William Camden described them in 1610 under their current name, although he didn't actually give any folklore to explain the name. And it's again, it's also subject to this idea of not being able to count the stones, because in 1634, three soldiers reported 77 stones in the ring. The Victorians counted between 66 and 67, and modern count suggests 59. While tradition claims that you can't reach the same number twice while counting them, you do also have to wonder if the general number has gone down over time because people have just been removing stones. Although, one legend does claim a fierce storm would rise up if anyone tried to uproot the stones, and I can't help feeling like that legend may have been put about to stop people nicking the stones after they'd already done so. Like the Hurlers, the stones were rumoured to have once been people, and in one version they were witches turned to stone as punishment. In the other, they were Meg's sisters, so quite where the idea of them being our daughters came from, I'm not really sure. 
But traveller Celia Fiennes described the story, saying that the sisters were punished for, and I quote, soliciting her to an unlawful love by an enchantment, end quote. And nobody ever really goes any further than that to explain exactly what Meg's sisters apparently did. But for whatever reason, Meg and her sisters were all turned into stone. An 18th century story claimed a saint turned the witches into stones for profaning a holy place, which implied some kind of holy properties to the site itself. That said, it could also mean the witches profaned a holy day and were petrified for doing magic on a Sunday. Now, according to legend, Meg stands above buried treasure, much like the legend about the lone main scriffer that we looked at last week, and the stone apparently bleeds if you chip pieces off it. Now, the thing that I find really interesting with Long Meg and her daughters is the fact that you get the folklore related to standing stones and circles in the same place. So this idea of the single stone marking the site of buried treasure plus everything else makes it a little bit more interesting as a site. In terms of the name though, Long Meg was actually a nickname given to any tall thin woman so it's likely that the stone got the name for its shape rather than a relationship to a woman named Meg. Occasionally people have assumed Long Meg to be Mega Meldon, the 17th century businesswoman accused of witchcraft who I do have an episode about but given Mega Meldon lived in Northumberland which is obviously the next county over and has a range of other stories associated with her ghost I can't help thinking that's a really strange link to make and it almost feels a little bit lazy just simply by going ah there was a witch called Meg there and this is a stone called Meg oh it must be the same person that's not really how it works. But even more strangely, a story in 1860 actually claimed that locals linked the stone circle to Michael Scott, the medieval wizard, which would be cool, but again, there's no real further explanation as to how that would work. Now we're going to head off to Stanton Drew, which is in Somerset, and this one boasts three stone circles, so there's a big one and then two smaller ones, with a group of three standing stones called the Cove in a nearby pub garden. Now, it is likely that antiquarian John Aubrey first recorded them in 1644, although the first maps actually date to 1723 by William Stukeley. And obviously, if you remember, William Stukeley is the guy who was just obsessed with druids. As with many stories of stone circles, legends explain the stones were a petrified party of people. And Aubrey wrote that the cove were the parson, bridegroom and bride. So there's kind of a lot of wedding folklore associated here. Another group of stones was the band, while the circles comprised the dancing guests. Later, the story evolved, as they usually do, and here the wedding took place on a Saturday. As the evening wore on, one player, who is either a piper or a harper, depending on the story, refused to play beyond midnight because it would mean playing on a Sunday. The furious bride claimed she would find another player, even if it meant travelling to hell to fetch one. So we've all heard stories about bridezillas, and I think this one kind of really does take the biscuit. But hell came to her in the form of the devil dressed as an old man. So he was like, fair enough, this guy won't play, I will. So he then started playing and the company danced, but they found that they couldn't actually stop dancing no matter how much they wanted to. And then they became stone in the morning when the sun came up. We also find this similar motif in other places, such as the Nine Maidens in Cornwall, again apparently turned to stone after dancing on a Sunday. It's such a common story type, that's why we're going to look at it in a bit more depth later. And I've also mentioned the idea of it being bad luck to count the stones and if you did so at Stanton Drew apparently it didn't just bring bad luck it could actually bring you death if you correctly counted the number of stones. But there was another cool story associated with Stanton Drew which wasn't present with any of the other ones and apparently this particular legend claims that the stones come to life at midnight on the sixth day after a full moon and then they walk down the river for a drink. So that looks like the kind of thing you could probably check relatively easily to see if they're doing that. But I thought that was quite interesting given the stories that were had last week of standing stones that apparently moved to go and get a drink. And I did also want to include one from Ireland. And this is the Athgraney Stone Circle in County Wicklow, which is also known as the Piper Stones, thanks to, you guessed it, local stories in which a piper and dancers kept playing and dancing on a Sunday and they were turned to stone for their trouble. You can actually spot the piper because he's the stone slightly away from the circle to the northeast. Now there are actually five circles in Ireland with the same name which just shows how common this particular myth actually was. But interestingly Aubrey Burl pointed out in 1976 that there may be a folk memory associated with these stories of dancing and stones. And while it's not a specific memory per se, it is possible that people may have known that prehistoric people danced or guessed that prehistoric people danced and the circles would simply make a good location for that. Because let's be honest, they are usually always on quite open and flat ground. So in terms of location, they would make sense as a marker. 
And other explanations given for the name in this area is that people actually heard bagpipe music in the area, although it's entirely possible that that could be fairy music that they were hearing. Now, the name of this one translates to Field of the Sun and it's all grain in Irish. And there's also a hawthorn tree in the circle linking it with the fairy folk. And this is, again, what made it a little bit more unusual than some of the other circles. Even now, apparently, people actually hang strips of cloth on the branches of this hawthorn tree, which turns into a form of clouty tree, which obviously were covered in the Holy Wells episode. But given the prohibitions on felling hawthorns, especially lawn hawthorns, this tree seems to have survived rather well. But lest you think all stone circles are related to petrified people, I did want to take a quick look at the Sunken Kirk Circle in Cumbria, also known as the Swinside Stone Circle. That's quite difficult to say quickly, but there we go. And this one has a couple of different stories attached to it. Now, yes, one of its common legends is that the stones are uncountable, but that's not the interesting one here, because a report in 1902 actually claimed that the stones were there because they were originally going to be used to build a church. The devil came along at night and made the stones sink into the ground so that they couldn't actually build the church. Now, this is obviously reminiscent of the various legends in which either the devil or the fairies move the foundation stones of a building to a different site, such as the Kalali Castle story. And obviously the Kalali Castle one's more about fairies, but when it tends to be the devil involved, it's usually so he can make sure a church isn't built on a particular site. And I always kind of wonder whenever I watch programmes like Grand Designs and or the George Clark one and somebody's house building project just isn't going according to plan. You're kind of like, are you going to come to the site one day and just find that everything's been moved somewhere else? Because that would be really funny. But that's a massive digression. Back to stone circles. Sunken Kirk is actually a traditional name found elsewhere, hence the reason why it's also called Swinside. And it's also not just found at prehistoric sites either. And there is a theory that it's because the ground wherever this name is used is believed to be boggy and had actually managed to swallow up a church thanks to the poor terrain. So I quite like the fact that this stone circle has this really cool link to basically what people have already noticed elsewhere in the landscape. But let's have a look at those two common themes, the idea of the countless stones and the petrified people. So the belief about stones being countless has actually been traced back before 1581 and so famous had the tradition actually become by the mid-17th century that Charles II apparently spent time on 7th of October 1651 trying to count Stonehenge's stones, one of the monuments famous for its apparently countless stones. And even Inigo Jones and Samuel Pepys had a go at counting them. Celia Fiennes visited Stonehenge in 1690, but she confidently asserted there were 91 stones, so she didn't have any problem counting them at all. But like I say, this particular belief is found across England, Wales and Ireland, and it is possible that someone might have heard a story about countless stones while travelling and then imposed it upon their local stone circle, but it's quite unlikely for that to be the case for all of them. So S.P. Menefee actually addressed that in 1975 and said that on one hand, the stones often look alike, which makes it quite difficult to know which ones you've actually counted. And it can also be quite hard to know which ones to include as part of the circle and which ones are simply nearby. And of course, at certain sites, the stones are just difficult to even see because maybe they've fallen over. They might be covered by greenery or whatever. So it's quite difficult to know if you should include it or not. Now, Menifee does suggest that if you look at legends associated with La Roche aux Fay in Brittany, which is a Neolithic gallery grave, you can also see other reasons, because in one of the stories here, the stones can actually move, which confuses the counter, and alternatively, the devil plays tricks on the person doing the counting. The third option is that there's actually a spell on the stones which stops the person from doing any counting, which is one of the theories applied to Stonehenge. Now, the idea that the stones can move on their own isn't really unusual because animism explains the stones have their own spirit and the stones just might have their own business to attend to. And in a Christian setting, such movement would then be recast as satanic. And this particular belief would be the one that would explain why the stones would then go for a drink. In some cases, people face retribution for attempting to count the stones and various legends claim that the person would die if they counted the right number. Sometimes it's if you count the same number twice, it depends. Now, somebody apparently counted the stones at Stanton during 1750, and soon after doing so, there was a sudden downpour, which locals linked to the counting. The fact that sudden downpours are quite common in English weather is probably not being taken into account. But this kind of idea of retribution even pops up in the stories about bakers putting loaves on the stones. So in some variations, the baker drops dead before he can call out the number. 
In others, one of the loaves vanishes to be replaced with the devil. And you might wonder, well, why would you use bread to mark the stones? And Menifee notes the apparently protective nature of bread. And obviously there was the whole episode about bread folklore, so you can have a listen to that and make up your own mind about it. But a side motif sees people mark one stone, meaning to then count around the circle from that point, which, let's be honest, that does actually make a lot of sense. Sometimes they find that when they sort of try and come back to where they started, the marker has been moved or there's additional markers and things like that. So there's one particular story type from County Galway where a milkmaid actually found treasure at one of the circles and used a cow bit to mark it. And then when she returned after telling everyone that she found treasure, there was lots of cow bits and she had no way of knowing which one was the right one. So you get various other ones as well where people mark the stone in some way with some kind of piece of fabric and then they turn away and come turn back and then all of the stones are covered in it. Now, the peril of counting things does appear in other superstitions. So, for example, it's bad luck to try and count the visible stars. And I don't know if it's linked to the idea that you could deter various supernatural creatures by planting juniper by your door, because the creature would then have to stop and count every leaf. And obviously, they would get so tied up in doing that that they wouldn't be able to actually enter your home. So I don't know if it's possible that the deterrent posed by counting something innumerable might explain why people thought counting the stones would bring bad luck. I don't know because the stories are always linked with vast circles with lots of stones in them. You don't tend to see these about like circles where there's like five stones or whatever, where you can quite easily see how many there are. So it may have a link with that. Who knows? The other belief is obviously the one about the stones being petrified people. And that one actually dates to 1602. Usually the people have been breaking the Sabbath but the legend does vary with there's usually different numbers of dancers because like I said with the hurler section they're nearly always dancers there's often a difference in their relationship to one another the type of musicians present changes and also to what extent the devil was involved often changes and they're often called merry maiden stories and the dancers are nearly always women in many cases the party was dancing to celebrate a wedding and the dancing then just continues into the sabbath But other variations do exist, which see people petrified for things like failing to salute the cross or not showing proper respect for funerals or processions. Now, Menifee actually thinks that the Sabbath motif came from the Merry Maidens legend type. So in this case, the wedding is punished for continuing onto the Sabbath because of the existing tradition around these girls dancing and all that kind of thing. There were a couple of other variations. So, for example, labourers might be punished for working on a Sunday and be turned into stone. And also there's an idea that the devil might actually tempt people into breaking the Sabbath. He's got things like a fondness for card games and so on. So it's entirely possible that, again, this kind of turning of people into stone is actually just the devil having a bit of a laugh. Because he obviously finds this funny. Now, while the story type itself may have been intended as a cautionary tale, obviously the idea being, you know, don't break the Sabbath because it's wrong and you'll get turned into stone. It's also possible that people actually just kept the legend alive to explain the existence of the circles because obviously in the absence of any knowledge about the function, the legend is pretty much as useful as anything else. So what do we ultimately make of these stone circles? Well, it is fascinating that the legends can be divided so easily into two camps. True, other circles do add extra tidbits like stones going for a drink. I'm particularly fond of that one or marking sunken churches. But on the whole, it's basically either bad luck to count the stones, or the stones were once people, or both. It, it, they're really, that's why it was so difficult to do this episode, because that was what it boiled down to. Now, it is unlikely that these stories were fossilised folk memories passed down across the ages. And also, there's quite a lot of links of, oh, people use them for magical ceremonies. We don't actually know. That kind of idea largely comes from people like Margaret Murray and Gerald Gardner. And again, there's just literally no way to know that because generally speaking, archaeology obviously can only look at what has been done often enough to leave a trace in the landscape. And for things like ritual activities, there's often just not the evidence for that, at least not in a way that would be able to definitively say that's what these stone circles were used for. The Sabbath breaking motif only dates to the Middle Ages at best, so obviously we do have to bear that in mind that that's clearly not a Bronze Age or even Neolithic belief. And meanwhile, the inability to count the stones reflects other law about not counting anything that comes in big numbers. And maybe it also harks back to a time when education rates were low and people couldn't count the stones. Now, while some people do now consider the stone circles a sacred site, like I say, we don't know how people used them or what they were actually for. They might be sacred or they might also turn out to serve a really, really boring and mundane purpose. There's just no real way to know at the time being. 
But on the off chance that they are a sacred space, then I would recommend that if you do visit one, remember to leave only footprints and take only photographs. Because after all, the devil does seem to be fond of them. So what I want to know is, which is your favourite stone circle? Obviously, you always feel free to send me photos and things. I do want to point out while I remember, because I forgot to say this last week, I am doing a talk on the 1st of April, and no, it's not an April Fool, but it is about April Fool's Day folklore, and also because of the nature of it, I want to also have a look at things like a bit of childhood folklore and some of the folklore of games and pranks and things like that. I'm doing that in conjunction with Cresswell Crags, so as ever, it's usually free, but obviously a donation helps them out, so that's always good. And I'm doing that at 6pm, so it'll be British summer time on the 1st of April. I do, I am aware that that is Easter Monday, but I double check with Cresswell Crags and they're fine doing it on a bank holiday. I don't have anything else on, so I'm happy doing it on a bank holiday. So obviously, if you are free, it would be lovely to see you there. We are going to have a look at things like barrows and chambered tombs and things like that next week followed by the large hill figures and so on to round out this particular month. So I hope that you're enjoying the folklore of sacred spaces in the landscape and I'll see you next week. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.